longer stints at St. Louis and especially Washington. Gonzaga 12 and 0 in the season, 39 in a row against Pepperdine. That goes back about 18, 19 years, and we'll see how it turns out tonight. For Pepperdine, this is their first game in 23 days. They are coming off a lengthy COVID pause. But on a positive note, they do have their entire roster available to them for the first time all season. Not only did they deal with COVID issues, Jay, they dealt with a number of injuries as well. Yeah, very difficult for Pepperdine to get any continuity on the season. In the first possession, Gonzaga goes man-to-man. -man. They double the post. They are switching just about everything. Uh, Gonzaga doesn't get enough credit for being a good defensive team. They're in the top 25 in the country defensively from an efficiency standpoint. It's just their offense is so powerful. That's going to make every headline. Yeah, offensively in terms of efficiency, number one just ahead of Iowa. And you look at some of the point totals Gonzaga's put up. They scored 102 against Kansas. They scored 98 against Virginia. Corey Kispert had nine threes in that game, and they're coming off a win at Portland in which they scored 116 points. 98 against Virginia seems like a point total you'd have if you played them twice. Right. You know, the, the idea that you did that in 40 minutes really just shows just how powerful this Gonzaga offense can be. Drew Timmy, a big guy with so much skill, has it swatted away, and it'll still be Gonzaga ball. There are three midseason Wooden Award candidates on the Gonzaga roster. Drew Timmy, Jalen Suggs, and Corey Kispert. Only two other programs, Illinois and Villanova, even have two players on the Wooden midseason 25. And Gonzaga's got three. And each one of those players, Dan, can give you 25 in a heartbeat in any given game. Timmy lost the handle. Ball still loose and a fortunate bounce for the Zags. Shot clock did not reset. Timmy looking for help. Subs the extra pass. Kispert for three, not there. A good block out by Kenneth Chakuka there on Anton Watson. You know, Gonzaga doesn't look sharp right now. Usually the ball moves, there's player movement. They haven't had that the first couple possessions. They are 3-0 in league play under Mark Fuse. Had such a remarkable run in Spokane. Better than 600 wins in his career and a winning percentage of better than 83%. What Mark Few has done at Gonzaga is absolutely mind-boggling. It's beyond a great job. Can we say future Hall of Famer without any hesitation? Zero hesitation. Yeah. I mean, as soon as as soon as they have another vote, I can't imagine that that he's not getting in. The first bucket of the game finally comes, and it belongs to Pepperdine. Victor Ohia Obioha, a six-nine junior from Nigeria, gives the Waves an early lead. A shot blocker and a rim runner, and that was typical of a rim run, but they got out in transition because Gonzaga has not run good offense thus far in the game. And forgive me, it was Chukwuka on the bucket giving uh, Pepperdine the early lead, and then Gonzaga comes back with a basket at the other end to tie it, so it's 2-2, two, two, two and a half minutes in. Chukwuka for the three, not there, and down with the rebound is Kispert, a senior who toyed with the idea of turning pro, found out, you know, what he needed to work on. Probably would have been a second-round pick. Came back, and he has gone from an extremely good player, Jay, to an outstanding All-American caliber player in his senior year. No, he's a great player. He, he can play anywhere on the floor. Uh, he's a he's six seven, big-time jump shooter. You know, gets high up on that jump shot with a high release. Can shoot it off the catch. He really hunts that shot. And you saw there on that last play, the cross-court pass. They're, they're always looking for the open man. For Gonzaga, their go-to guy is the open man on every possession. That's a great way to play. Joel Ayayi comes up with the steal. A little give and go. Bounce pass to Suggs. And then Ayayi is there to clean it up. A 6-5 guard who averages better than eight rebounds per game. He's their leading rebounder. As you say, it's 6-5 and thin. Gets two offensive rebounds a game. And it's not just that, that he pursues the ball and has a nose for it. He goes to the glass every possession. One of the reasons that Ayayi gets so many rebounds is he, because he goes to the glass. Not, not all players do that. 
Shot clock down to seven. Ross with a step back jumper, not there, but the rebound to Kispert. Well guarded by Anton Watson, an excellent athlete. When your 6'8 guy can switch out on the opposing point guard and do that good a job, you got a pretty good defense. Kispert open for three, and after the Wave scored the first bucket of the game, it's a 10 0 run right now for the Zags. Well, Corey Kispert is allowed to shoot the ball from the catch spot. He, he's tough enough to deal with on the move. That's way too easy for Gonzaga. Just a really good job by uh, Ohia Obioha to set a screen, just roll right to the basket. But if you don't make Corey Kispert put the ball on the floor before he shoots it, he's going to tear you apart. Timmy will line up a three. And we get a foul going against Watson of the Zags to take us to our first media timeout with the number one team in the nation leading by six in the early percent from three. And not surprisingly, a very good free throw shooter as well. 87% from the line. What an unbelievably productive player Corey Kispert has been this season. And it's amazing how many points in the paint that Gonzaga scores. And it's not because, you know, they jam it inside to Drew Timmy. It's because they're such a good cutting team and they get so much in transition. So they actually get a lot of layups. Well, here's a crazy stat for you. You and I were talking about this. One thing Gonzaga does not do a ton of is shoot the three. I mean, they can do it, but they're not an outstanding three-point shooting team as Johnny Smith comes up with a bucket for the Waves. But we mentioned that Gonzaga just scored 116 points at Portland in their last game. They had four threes in the game and scored 116 points. Yeah, it's really remarkable. I mean, Kispert is their best three-point shooter. And he's got 37 threes, including the two he made. Uh, early on in this game, but after that it, it's Jalen Suggs and, and Joe uh, Joel Ayayi. Other than that, there aren't a ton of shooters. Uh, right there is, uh, are the Zags at their best. They don't finish, but terrific in transition and rewarded with a trip to the free throw line. Well, they've got so many handlers, guys that can rebound and bring it up themselves. Uh, I mean, including Drew Timmy has done that. I mean, he did it against Portland, grabbed a rebound, brought it up uh, on his own. And he also had 26 points in that game, but You've got multiple guys that can rip and run. They grab the board, they bring it up. You don't have to waste time making a, an outlet pass. And guys run, and they run to the rim. Uh, it's really a, it's a beautiful offense to watch because it's not based upon set plays. It's based upon actions and then reads that the players make based on those actions. And all of them are smart, and all of them know how to play. The one, two, two, three quarter court pressure. Gonzaga's run that forever. Andre Ball with the elbow jumper. A cousin of the of Lonzo, Lamello, the Ball family. A little bit strong on that one. Kispert thought about it. Instead, Timmy gets a touch, but he left it short. Ball's loose. Ayayi comes up with it, and the Zags retain possession. In and out for Kisper. Look at the effort by Suggs to keep it alive. But it goes over to the Waves. Ross in transition takes a bump and turns it over. But he's a little upset that he didn't get a foul call there. He's really one on four. Look at Timmy. A big guy who handled and passed and played guard before a growth spurt in high school. And he has retained, Jay, all of those perimeter skills. And we we're just talking about guys that can bring it up, and Timmy's one of them. And he initiates the offense and gives a little Euro step, a little in and out move, and goes right over the top of Chubuka, who's a, a terrific athlete and a, a good defender. But he's more of a post defender, and Timmy took advantage of him uh, in a little bit more open space. And you saw his numbers on the season, terrific. He's had some big games, 29 against Virginia, 25 against Kansas. Timmy's from Texas and uh, gave a, a good look, almost wound up going to Texas Tech, but when he was making a decision, he wound up telling Texas Tech head coach Chris Beard that, you know, I really like Gonzaga's style of play and their coaching staff, and Chris told me, he goes, what was I going to do, tell them the coaches aren't good guys? He goes, they're, they're, the best, they're the best guys there are. He says, they can make them into a pro? Well, how am I going to argue with that? Right. Hey, Chris Beard got a big win last night, didn't he? Back with Clung with a game winner to, to beat the Longhorns in Austin. Yeah, that was a great win for Texas Tech, and they showed a ton of toughness coming back in that game because they could have packed it in. Ross knocks down a three for Pepperdine to get him back within seven. 
What do you think it's like for a team like the Waves, Jay? Lorenzo Romar's team has not played in 23 days because of COVID. How tough is that? Well, it's really difficult. And, and you know, although Florida State might say it's not so bad. I mean, Florida State just came off a pause and they wound up scoring over 100 against NC State and shot over 70%. Yeah. So I don't think I don't think it bothered the Seminoles that badly. But just not having the continuity of being able to practice. I mean, Pepperdine couldn't really practice. They had kind of more individual work for the longest time. So they're not going to be, you would imagine they're not going to be as sharp and maybe as physical as they'd like to be in a game where you need to be. Another great feed inside, and the beneficiary is Ayayi for the easy bucket. And Florida State dismantled NC State last night as Ross gets a floater to go on the baseline. You and I will see the Seminoles against North Carolina Saturday at noon. Florida State's got so much depth. I mean, they just bring, it's like watching a hockey team when they, uh, they make a line change. And we're going to push underneath going against Pepperdine as Ayayi was in there hunting a rebound again at the offensive end. Yeah, it's so hard to block out Ayayi because he's coming from the perimeter. And and the truth is most wings aren't used to on the perimeter turning around and blocking out. They're used to just going and getting the ball. And Ayayi can be quicker to the ball than a lot of the wings he plays against. Aaron Cook to inbound it for Gonzaga, a grad transfer by way of Southern Illinois, who has given the Zags some nice minutes. Really good veteran quality depth off the bench at the point guard spot. Another great feed. That was from Andrew Nemhard to Umar Balo, but Balo couldn't finish it. And Nemhard is such a good passer and a good player. He's excellent in pick and rolls. I think uh, Mark Few has called him surgical in the way he dissects a pick and roll. He came up with a loose ball, finds a wide open Kispert, who misses the three. He doesn't miss many of those, does he? No. Made a couple early, two for four on the night from three point range. Colby Ross, the leader for Pepperdine. No active player has more career assists than the guy with the ball right now with Ross, who drives and draws the foul and will be at the free throw line when we come back. And Mr. Basketball and Mr. Football in the state of Minnesota. And a McDonald's All-American in basketball decided to focus on basketball and eventually chose Gonzaga over schools like his home state school, Minnesota, Florida, Florida State, Iowa State, were other programs that he considered. Just a freshman, if you look at any NBA mock draft, you will see Jalen Suggs listed in the top five. You and I were doing a game against West Virginia a few weeks back when Suggs suffered what looked like a very serious ankle injury. It was, you know, kind of mid to late in the first half. And he came back in the second half and finished out the game. Shocked both of us the way that it looked when the injury happened. Well, the way it looked when it happened, and, and of course, we never want to speculate. We did not know, but it looked like an Achilles. The, the way, remember the way he responded yeah. to it right away? Yeah. And we, we everybody was fearful, and, and we weren't the only ones thinking it. I promise you that. But when he came back into the game, uh, the, just the fact that he, he wanted to get back out there and, uh, and really gutted it out it was really impressive. Johnny Smith with another bucket. Pepperdine back within five, but now a foul on the inside on Andre Ball. We'll send Joel Ayayi to the line. It's so impressive the way Gonzaga moves without the ball. They, they cut hard, and they move the ball so well. Then you've got Timmy posting up and drawing so much attention that Ayayi was able to get lost on that cut. And Kispert, if you don't get pressure on the ball to take away vision, they're going to pick you apart. You mentioned it off the top of the show, Joel Ayayi coming off a triple-double in the win over Portland a few days ago. The first triple-double in program history, and maybe most amazingly, he had the triple-double three minutes into the second half. There were still 17 minutes left in the game, and he already had it. Ultimately finished with 12 points, 13 rebounds, and 14 assists. When you saw that, that Ayayi had the first triple-double in Gonzaga history, I, I can't... I can't lie to you. I, I was surprised. 
Yeah. Not surprised that he got it, but surprised that it hadn't been done before with all the, the truly great players and NBA players that Gonzaga's had over the last 20 years. Plus, Absolutely. John Stockton played at Gonzaga <laughs> and, uh, and never had one. That, that's uh, pretty amazing for a Yayi to be the, the first, and I know there'll be others, but to be the first. Robbie Heath off the bench with a bucket for the Waves, and they are hanging around. Ten minutes into the game, almost down by four. Wide open look for Cook not there, and a better job of the glass this time by Pepperdine. And that's a wide open three for Aaron Cook, who transferred in from Southern Illinois as a, a grad transfer, essentially. Uh, but, you know, you're not going to get a better shot than that. And Zaga now, after a couple of early threes by Kisper, that's it from beyond the arc so far. They are two of nine from three-point range. Ross with a pull-up, and it's a two-point game. That is big time. He is so good using ball screens. Doesn't just blast off it, plays with great pace. He can snake through defenders, which he did right before our last break where he got, he got fouled. He's just got a, a great ability to make decisions and get fouled doing it. And he's put up some huge numbers. Had 43 in a double overtime loss to St. Mary's in a West Coast Conference tournament game last year and had 33 in a triple overtime loss to UCLA earlier this season. Well, Robbie Heath didn't hit that three, but that was a great pass by Colby Ross. Gonzaga's not moving the way they normally move. They got to get better ball movement and player movement. That's that's the way they play, and thus far it's been a little bit slower than than you'd expect from from the Zags. Take a look here, at Colby Ross just coming off that ball screen and then pulling up. Timmy wasn't right on top of it, but if you do get up and crowd him, he's going to be able to put a little pack, uh, pocket pass and get it to Kendall Munson there over, or he just goes over the top and hits the wing on the opposite side. Just a, a great awareness off of screen roll situations for Colby Ross. But a problem here for Lorenzo Romar in the waves. Foul number two, and at least for now, Ross goes to the bench, and we'll see how long he stays there. He's a senior, and does Romar trust him to get back in there at some point and play with a couple of fouls? I would venture to guess that after the next break, he's coming back in. So you just want to keep him from picking up that third one before you go to the next TV timeout. But I don't think he's going to spend much time on that bench at all. Ayayi yeah, splits a pair, and it's a three-point lead for the Zags. Their closest game this year was a five-point win over West Virginia. Every other game has been by more than that, but they've got themselves a bit of a battle on their hands right now as Heath knocks down a jumper, and the Waves are only down by one. Heath is from Australia. He came into this game only one of nine from the field, but he can really shoot it. Excellent free throw shooter. He's got a great stroke. Ayayi for three, the assist to Timmy. It's really good inside-outside interaction. You get it into the post, it collapses the defense, and Timmy's such a willing passer, hits Ayayi with a great pass. He fouled on the uh, jumper. Ayayi eventually acknowledges that it was on him. He didn't like that call at all. Saturday, got a couple of great games to start a full day of college basketball on ESPN. As Jay and I mentioned, we'll have the Tar Heels and the Seminoles at noon Eastern. Then it's off to the SEC for Kentucky and Auburn. Sharif Cooper with a couple of games under his belt for the Tigers. Both games also available on the ESPN app. Sharif Cooper has been eligible for Auburn for a couple games now. That dude is a baller, man. If he play, if he played the whole season, we'd be he'd be a household name by now. I mean, he's a 25 point a game guy. He's that good. Pepperdine defeated Gonzaga. And Paul Westfall was not only a, a great player, great Hall of Famer. Went to Aviation High School in Redondo Beach, not far from where I grew up, and starred at Southern Cal back when you know UCLA was everything and had a, a near undefeated team that only lost to UCLA when he was playing for the Trojans and, and had a, a great NBA career large part of that with the Phoenix Suns I mean what a what a great human being Paul Westfall was and the officials 
stop time. I think the shot clock reset, and they did not want it to reset. It was, I don't think they deemed that to be a change of possession as the ball was kind of batted around before the Zags got it back. So, yeah, there the shot clock is at 21. And Joel Ayayi coming off that triple-double. He's already got 11 points and four steals, three rebounds as well. As the tips up and good for Anton Watson. Well, they got the ball to Drew Timmy on that out-of-bounds underneath. Good cut inside by Heath. That was really pretty. This is just Heath's third game for the Waves. Coming off injuries, played at Westchester University last year a division two school in pennsylvania where he scored better than 24 points per game just a terrific pass wasn't a bullet just kind of sort of like one of those you know out backside shoulder passes you throw to somebody going to the end zone and just out of the reach of andrew nemhard the defender and pretty good and english on the reverse layup too majoring in, in english well, one, of, one of the things that pepperdine has to do is they've got to get Kessler Edwards involved in the game. Yeah. You know, when he gets when he gets in there, he's got to he's got to score. Right now, Heath becoming the go-to guy for the Waves. You mentioned Edwards. He's a 17-point a game guy for Pepperdine this year. He has not scored in this game. He's about 6'8", really good athlete that can step away and shoot it. You know, coming into the game, he'd made 17 out of 41 threes. That's about 41, 42%. But he's got great versatility. He's the top rebounder on this Pepperdine team. He can play inside and out. But I don't think Pepperdine can, can win this game if he doesn't put some significant points on the board. This is one thing they do very well. Fourth in Division One in free throw shooting. One of two for Heath and a one-point game. Heath now with nine points off the bench. The bench numbers are 16 to nothing in favor of Pepperdine. Well, usually that wouldn't bother you as long as your starters are killing it. Timmy, nice spin move. Got it back, had it blocked. And saved. Great hustle there. Boy, what a difference to have Ohia Obioha in there to be able to protect the rim. They were missing that when they played Cal State Bakersfield. And Pepperdine has taken the lead in Spokane on the number one team in the nation. Cedric Altman with a bucket, waves by one. Kispert hesitated on that shot. He had a wide open three and usually does not hesitate. Jalen Suggs on the drive and draws the foul. Did a great job, did Jalen Suggs, of going right into the defense. You know, you could see right there that Cedric Altman did not have legal guarding position, and Suggs knew it and just sought out his body and created that contact. His first points of the night and a chance for a three-point play. Jalen also second cousin to footballer Terrell Suggs. And as we mentioned before, Jalen with some football in his background as well. Mr. Football in the state of Minnesota last year. Boy, that's a, a lob into about quadruple coverage right there. That one had no chance of working. Suggs hits the deck and saves it. Oh, what a pass. And then all alone, a sweet feed underneath for the bucket. Boy, Demhart did such a good job of faking to Kispert in the left corner and then finding a teammate under the bucket. That was just absolutely beautiful. That was like a quarterback looking off a primary receiver. Just outstanding basketball by Andrew Nemhard. Now, after Suggs is able to get him the ball here, that just that pass fake got the defense to jump and then found Suggs underneath. Just spectacular passing by Andrew Nemhard. A two year starter with the University of Florida who transferred to Gonzaga. Has an unbelievable assist to turnover ratio this year of four and a half to one. 54 assists and 12 turnovers coming into the game tonight. Timmy 
And he'll go to the free throw line. Timmy's just such a good job of running the floor and getting post position under the basket. And then with that four and around uh, four around one configuration that Gonzaga has, he's going to be open. They just have to get the ball to the right angle. A little bit strong on the free throw. There you see three of the guys on the Zags team with really good assist to turnover numbers, especially Nemhard Ayayi, three point four to one, and Suggs just about two to one. Well, when you combine that kind of passing ability and feel for the game with protecting the ball as well and being able to play at a, a high rate of speed and still take care of the ball. That, that's that's big time. It, it means Gonzaga is going to get more shots. And with the way they can score, you get more shots, you're going to be in good shape. I'm sorry, Jay. Darrell Pope Jr. with a driving layup. That won't make Mark Few happy. That was too easy. And they're getting some minutes out of Pope with uh, Colby Ross on the bench with a couple of fouls. And the block underneath. Kispert will be going to the free throw line. Kispert has such a great base. There's uh, just too easy, as as you had mentioned, off that little ball screen. There's just no help at all and no communication. And then a terrific job by Kispert when he caught the ball, caught it, great base, shot fake, and drive. Everything he does is, is so, I mean, it's it's so simple in concept, but it's just hard to do. You know, he, he's he's such a smart player. He's got great feet and, and just spectacular technique. And he's been a big part of an unbelievable run in recent years for the Zags. His record, Jay, this is, he's a senior in four years now in Spokane. His record is 107 and 10 as a collegiate. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. The 1-3-1. One, Half-court trap here by Gonzaga. Suggs on the back end. And Kessler Edwards way too strong with a three. A fresh possession, though, now for the Waves, but not for long. They turn it over. Zags looking to run, as always. And Suggs called for the offensive foul. That'll be his second. Boy, just on that break, that was a heck of a catch in transition by Ayayi. That, that ball was thrown behind him, caught it with his right hand. You know, tough call for Suggs. Not sure I agree with it, but, you know, it was close. So Suggs to the bench after picking up his second. And this is where they really benefit from the transfer of Nebhard, getting a season starting point guard in there who can play alongside Suggs or really operate at the point when Suggs is on the bench. Point having... Anton Watson at 6'8 with his athleticism to be able to essentially play the point of that 1-3-1 just giving Pepperdine a little bit of a different look so they can't just you know, really Pepperdine's kind of been waltzing into their offense without a lot of pressure so Mark Few and his staff wanting to switch things up a little bit Cedric Altman at the line for Pepperdine a sophomore from Rialto, California averaging about 6.5 points per game Give the Waves credit. Again, I know we mentioned it, but coming off a 23-day COVID pause, they do have their entire roster available to them for the first time all season, and they are playing hard, playing well, and giving number one everything they can handle those so far. And Gonzaga, I think, is used to this kind of thing where, you know, you watch some of Pepperdine's tapes. I mean, actually, when I told uh, Lorenzo Romar, you know, I'd watched their last two games, you know, pretty intently. He says, well, you've seen all our dirty laundry. Their last two games, they did not play well. Didn't play well defensively. Their rebounding was poor. You know, a lot of holes that were exposed by, especially Cal State Bakersfield. But you knew that, that that was not the team that played the last two games for Pepperdine was not going to be the team that was going to show up tonight that they were going to play with everything they had. They've done that thus far. Oh, bad pass there, stolen away. And this will be an easy one for Watson. And after the Kispert three the time before, all of a sudden it's an eight-point lead now for the Zags. Yeah, Watson's coming off a really good game against Portland. He had 23. And such a good athlete with quick feet and good skills. And he really can be a game-changer defensively because he can guard one through five. And a Spokane native as well. So playing for his hometown team and playing well. Yeah, Sean, uh, Michigan's top tier uh, along with, with Baylor and Gonzaga. I mean, I think Gonzaga's the best offensive team. Baylor's the, the most complete offense and defense. 
Actually, Baylor's a better three-point shooting team than Gonzaga. When was the last time we've said that in the last 20 years? But, but I agree with you. Michigan is spectacular. And Hunter Dickinson has been, along with Kate Cunningham of Oklahoma State, I think the best freshman in America. I mean, what, what other freshman is playing at as high a level as Dickinson? Just, just remarkable. Michigan at seven. That win over Wisconsin was unbelievably impressive. And we both think, Jay, they'll move up to three or four or something like that when the, the new poll comes out on Monday with Isaiah Livers and Franz Wagner, Mike Smith, the grad transfer from Columbia. I mean, they just got so many weapons, so many different ways to beat you. If they're not three, like, I... I, I I can't make a case for, for Michigan to be one or two because of Baylor and Gonzaga. But if Michigan's not three, there needs to be some sort of investigation. <laughs> uh, because they, they've beaten three top, what is it, three top 15 teams Something by like that, 19 yeah. or more, which has not happened before. And they, they their game against Wisconsin, after a while, it looked like clubbing baby seals. They, they beat them so badly, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. They had a run that started late in the first half and carried over into the second half. That was a 36-3 to run against Wisconsin, which is a top-10 team itself. You and I saw Wisconsin uh, maybe at their best against what was then an undermanned Louisville team, but Wisconsin's really good, really old, really connected. Wisconsin, had, uh, Michigan rather, had a 36-3 to run against the Badgers. Yeah, I mean, you hear about a run like that in, in a, a game against another opponent. You might say, okay, well, I could see that happening. I mean, it's still extraordinary. Against Wisconsin? I mean, what would the odds of that have been going into the game if somebody had said, hey, you know, I think the Michigan's going to go on a 36-3 to run against Wisconsin. You go, no way. And it happened. Kessler Edwards, a 42% three-point shooter on the season, knocks down a three. Fourth assist to the game for Ross. And Pepperdine back with an eight. Now they come up with a steal. Well, Pepperdine is really rallying to the ball. That was just not a good pass because Timmy was surrounded. Edwards, same spot and same result. And all of a sudden, it's a five-point game. And timeout. Down. A couple of threes. He's now... Two of five from three-point range and scored six quick points. And that makes Pepperdine a completely different team. Well, the brother Cameron had a terrific career in Malibu. Graduated last year. Nemhard with a layup. I'll tell you, I know this. I think if I went to college in Malibu and they granted an extra year, I think I'm staying no matter what. I don't care what my options in life are. If they give me a fifth year in Malibu, Jay, I'm taking it. Well, I grew up about 20 miles south of... Pepperdine and actually when when I was in high school Jim Herrick was the coach at Pepperdine recruited me and he used to call up and say it's mighty fine at the dime today Jay <laughs> and he was right every day it's mighty fine at the dime I'll tell you Lorenzo what Dan Omar. it's pretty it's a pretty good decision by Lorenzo Romar I, I thought that Colby Ross be back in the game in no time with those two fouls but look how well that Pepperdine's been able to hang in there essentially without him and Nemhard dipped the shoulder. He gets called for the foul. By the way, just for fun, as you heard the guys back in the studio, uh, uh, Sean Farnham was asking Jay about a Gonzaga Baylor being in the top two. So you get another look at the foul. Just for fun. Remember, Gonzaga and Baylor were supposed to play earlier this year, but a COVID issues forced the postponement of that game. It may be a long shot, Jay, but if somehow there was a window available for both programs, both coaches have said they are still very open to the idea of trying to get that game in. Yeah, basically, Mark Fee was saying, just leave your cell phone on, and there are going to be a lot of opportunities to try to get games in with all the disruptions we've had. And, you know, both Gonzaga and Baylor have tried to find other games. Chaka Smart at Texas. Boy, if I were Gonzaga, I'd go right at Colby Ross right now. It's Heath guarding Ayayi with nine seconds to go in the half. Off the fingertips of Timmy. And a shot clock violation will give it back over to the Waves. Dan, you know, we've been talking about this has not been the best half 
we've seen from Gonzaga. It probably one of their you know, least efficient halves. They still got 43 points. Yeah. 43 points. And they didn't play well. Good if it goes, and it does. Polk went three quarters the length of the court. Lead to the rim, and this last play indicative of the first half. Great job by Pepperdine, but if you're watching Gonzaga's film, you're saying we're really going to let somebody waltz all the way down the court and get into a shot that easily. So I think we'll see a better, a uh, different Gonzaga team in the second half. Gonzaga third in the nation in assist to turnover ratio, but not good in that department in the first half. Seven assists and eight turnovers, but what a great start to the second half, the fourth three of the night for Corey Kisper. That's more of what we're used to. A little back screen and Suggs comes off it, and instead of going to the basket, he looks opposite and finds Kispert spotting up in the left corner. That was just beautiful. Ball is loose out of bounds. It stays with Pepperdine. Colby Ross, the leader for Pepperdine, 13 minutes, picked up two fouls in the first half, four points and four assists. He's a guy who averages 19 points per game on the season. Yeah, Colby Ross leads this team in scoring assists and one of the top assist guys in the country leading the West Coast Conference in assists, but also leads them in steals, does so many different things. That ball poked away from behind by Suggs. He runs the floor, gets it back, lays it in. Uh, clearly, Gonzaga came out in the second half and wanted Pepperdine to feel them and feel them on the defensive end. You can see that Gonzaga moving as the ball moves. They're there on the catch, a little more active. And a foul on Suggs. That's going to be his third, and that's why you see that kind of a reaction from him. He's frustrated because he knows that might cost him some playing time. That was just a senior play by Colby Ross. Just really understood that Suggs was out of position and just went right into his body to pick up that foul. At least for the moment, Suggs will stay. And then Chukwuka backing down Suggs. Suggs hit the deck. No foul call. And then a missed easy one for Ohia Obioha. Chukwuka backed him down. Just a little flop there by Suggs. And then I don't know what was called here. Couldn't really tell. I guess it was just a foul on the rebound by Kispert. There wasn't a whole lot of contact there. Watson kicks it back out. It's a little loose with the ball on this trip, but they've still got it, and now eventually they do turn it over. And I think Kispert knew as soon as he threw that pass, all he had to do was take one dribble toward the baseline, and he would have had a great angle to get that ball into Timmy. As soon as he let it go, you could see he knew that that, that was not the right pass to make. Kispert and Ayayi leading the way for the Zags, each with 14. Nobody in double figures for the Waves. The scoring a bit more balanced for them. Gonzaga coming into the game tonight, averaging 96 points per game. Ball bounces to Ayayi, and he winds up getting fouled, and he'll head to the free throw line. By the way, the last whistle, Jay, when we were wondering what it was at the other end of the floor, evidently it was a flop warning call going against Jalen Suggs, I believe. That was the, the right call because that was a flop. I just don't understand why they have to stop the game to make those warnings. It doesn't seem like they, they should... I mean, they, they wait until later on to check out. And it's not the referee's fault. It's the rule's fault. But, heck, they wait until the next stoppage in play to see well, if something's a three or a two. They could wait to give the flop warning. And don't know if they're talking about the flop call or the foul call, but Suggs has had a couple of calls go against him in the early stages of the second half. You know, Dan, what the best way to eliminate flopping is, is don't call, don't reward a flop with a charge call, which way too often happens. That'll stop flopping. And now Ayayi gets called for the foul, and he is yelling that he got held or he few that I think all we have probably is the common foul on Joel Ayayi. And that's the right result. It just too long, took too long to get to the right result. 
So Ayayi's got three, and Suggs has three. Suggs has gone to the bench. Nemhart is now in for the Zags, but Ayayi is still on the floor. And there's another Gonzaga foul. This one is on Watson, his second. And Anton Watson done such a good job of getting Chukwuka to pick up his dribble and essentially stop the play. He didn't need to reach in with one hand there. If you can get the ball with two hands, go after it with two hands. But it's going to be difficult to knock it out of somebody's hands like that without picking up a foul. Ross from the corner won't go with a rebound to Kisper. Gonzaga will look to push at every opportunity, but now Nemhard gets called for the foul. And Jay, I believe that's number three on Nemhard. Oh, well, Gonzaga guards getting in foul trouble. I just don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think he got there, but those are the good kind of charges where it's the primary defender. It's not the, it's not the secondary defender coming over. Zags in transition again. Nemhart trying to go the distance again. It's out of bounds, but still belongs to Gonzaga. So Suggs with three, Ayayi with three, and Nemhard with three early in the second half. And you can see in the background there, Ayayi just went to the bench. Well, the good news for Gonzaga, they've got a lot of different options for players coming off the bench. And it's a it's a Pretty darn deep team, especially at the guard position. Timmy with a turnaround, left it short. You know, Jay, he's got seven points, six rebounds, three assists. Those are good numbers early in the second half, but it has been a relatively quiet night so far, it feels like, for Drew Timmy. It hasn't been his strongest moves uh, with the ball, either going to the basket or even that last play. Like, he can make a, a fadeaway. He's got so many different moves down in the post, but he just hasn't gone with the uh, same kind of strength that he has throughout the season. I mean, you know, you know, Dan, he's averaging over 18 points a game, just under seven rebounds. He's a really good offensive rebounder, and his footwork is is really magnificent for a big guy. And how about this, Jay? Nemhard, his fourth. He's out. Suggs back in with three. And a guy who may factor into this game large down the stretch is Aaron Cook. The point guard and a, uh, a fifth-year senior from St. Louis went to Southern Illinois. Uh, an experienced player, a two-year starter with Southern Illinois. And with the foul trouble for the other point guards, we may see a lot of minutes for Cook in the second half. Yeah, Cook is a really good defender. Suggs has to be careful playing with three, knowing that Nemhard's got four. And a wide open three won't go down for Dominic Harris, 6'3 freshman from Murrieta, California. Second time in a week, Jay, that we have said Murrieta on the air in one of our games. Yeah, Evan Mobley and Isaiah Mobley from yeah. USC, both from Murrieta. So Harris getting some minutes because of the foul trouble in the backcourt for Gonzaga. We give a lot of credit to Pepperdine's defense, but some of the, the decisions, the passing decisions, have been unzag like in this ballgame. Timmy will be at the free throw line when we come back. Some foul trouble for number one from the free throw line. 16 points uh, in this ballgame, you know, saddled with some foul trouble. But how about this, Dammy? For, for Gonzaga, they got 50 points. They're shooting 45% from the field. And they've made five threes. And the feeling you have because of the standard they've set this year is, well, they haven't played well at all. Right. And that's how good this team is. You know, they, they put up 50, and we're like, eh, that's pretty good. Boy, Pepperdine had another great opportunity to get even closer, but Victor Ohia Obioha, for the second time this half, missed a chippy right at the rim. Boy, really good job by Colby Ross to take away that little pitchback action that Suggs and Kisper were running, where Kisper just runs behind Suggs to get a quick three. Ross really knows what he's doing out there in every respect, doesn't he? He's got a great understanding of the game. You know, when, when coaches say he's got a great feel, that's, that's coach speak for he's a really smart player. Like, you just can't have feel without being smart out on the floor. It's just no, you know, it's like when you, when, when you say, hey, this kid really knows how to play. I mean, he's a really smart basketball player. And there he is drawing another foul. 
And he's done a lot of that here in the second half. He's got the freshman in Harris covering him right now. Yeah, just a nice spin move along the baseline and gets Harris into the air and then able to draw that foul. I bet for his size, he draws more fouls than any other player in the country. A senior from Aurora, Colorado. Pepperdine's all-time leading scorer and assist leader as well. And the Zags are well aware of him. In the two games between these two programs last year, Ross had 47 points and 16 assists. And he's so dedicated that uh, it, it said, I haven't seen this because I would never do this, but it said he gets up at 4.30 in the morning to get shots up. <laughs> That, that would only be a rumor. Time. That would only yeah. be a rumor to me. I would never confirm that on my own. When's the last time, other than to make a flight, you? Were, when's the last time you were willingly up at 4:30 in the morning? When I was driving Raftery home. <laughs> so that feels like an asterisk. I think of the record book. That one comes with an asterisk. <laughs> That's more the Gonzaga we've come to know turning defense into offense, getting something easy. We haven't seen much of Gonzaga getting easy baskets in this game. Spectacular save by Jalen Suggs and then a great pass at the end by Cook to get it to a, a running Kispert for an easy bucket in the lane. And you got to do difficult things. You got to do the hard things to get easy baskets. And we haven't seen a lot of easy baskets from Gonzaga tonight. Yeah, they had a ton of them Saturday against Portland. And right now, according to our stats monitor, fast break points are 11-9 in favor of the Zags. We've got another foul going against Gonzaga. Timmy, and you could see though on the court, not just to win, but to make the right play. And it's, it's really a pleasure to watch Colby Ross play basketball. 38 in a game against USC last season. 33 in a game earlier this year against UCLA, a triple overtime loss. And Lorenzo Mar uh, Romar, you know, asked him recently, you know, what, what would you like to see your team improve upon? He didn't hesitate. He says, we got to defend, we got to rebound at a higher level. I mean, the game against Bakersfield, uh, they, they got crushed on the glass. Now, Bakersfield's a really good rebounding team. You know, North Carolina's the best offense, uh, second best offensive rebounding team in the country. Bakersfield's number one. <laughs> and it goes. Timmy with a chance for a three-point play. Much stronger move by Drew Timmy. Stronger with the ball. Stronger post move. That was a much, much more aggressive move to the basket and used that left hand to get it off the glass. Just so poised when he gets the ball in the post. He's got great hands, a drop step, up and under, fade away. And he's also an excellent passer out of the post. So when it goes in there, it's not just a black hole. If he gets doubled, he can find an open teammate. And he was a guy had a terrific freshman season, but it, it feels Jay, like it, like a lot of people saw this big step forward to where he would have become one of the the best big men of the country in his sophomore year. Right? Well, he's playing essentially not behind Philip Petrushev, but you know Petrushev's going to be the the guy that that they went to more often. Yeah. But he's really matured into being a, a go to guy as a big guy for Gonzaga. Forces it up and hits. Now right on cue. You know, Dan, that, that's kind of what Gonzaga is. It's sort of old school in a way that I think when you go there, you, know, you expect to get rewarded when you play well, and you will. But there is a, a kind of, you don't want to say wait your turn because these guys are all competitors. They're not going to wait. They're going to they're going to play their tails off, and they want they want it now. But you do you do have some maturing that you're going to do behind at times better players that are older and more experienced and you know that's what we've seen out of Drew Timmy he just gets better and better and and that's what that's been the journey of, of Corey Kispert as well when he yeah. came in yeah you know, he played a supporting role and had some great moments and you could see this guy's going to be really good and you know the one thing is Mark Few and his staff they're believers like they know that even though a player as a freshman may not be showing what they're capable of later on, they know what they're going to be. And like that guy right there, Mark Few, I've not I've not been around many believers like him. Like I, I can tell you that that years ago, you know, 
guys like me would say, hey, when are you going to take a, a big time job? You know, well, like, hey, are you going to take maybe take UCLA or this job or that job? You know, because you can win one there. And he's like, we can win one here. He, he's been saying that for 20 years. Like, well, we can win the national championship here. And, and he was right. And and he was one of he was one of the only ones that thought that. And he's the reason why they're doing this. Almost won the national championship in 2017. He made it to the national championship game. Lost to North Carolina. The last five years, this excludes last year, of course, because there wasn't a tournament. The last five tournaments, Gonzaga's gone Elite Eight, Sweet 16, national runner-up, Sweet 16, Elite Eight. They have made the tournament in every one of Mark Few's seasons as head coach and of course Dan Munson coached them to the Elite Eight and then left to go to Minnesota Mark Few was an assistant took over and has elevated the program to where it is without question one of the premier programs in America it's one of the great the greatest success stories in I think American sports history like the, there's no you know people say that, that want to be detractors that's fine like they you know it's okay to be skeptical of things but they'll say, well, you know, they've done it out of the West Coast Conference. Okay, well, if you want to say, okay, it's a smaller conference, it's, it's not as hard to get to the tournament as it is in the Big Ten. Okay, that's fair. That's a fair point. But show me who, who's done that in other small conferences. There, there are 25 small conferences. Right. Who's done it? And the answer is nobody. Nobody's done what Gonzaga's done at this level for this period of time. It, it's absolutely remarkable. There's been great stability on the coaching staff. You know, Tommy Lloyd's been with them forever. They do an unbelievable job recruiting internationally as Watson lays it in. Well, look at the caliber of player that they're recruiting. I mean, years ago, they've always had outstanding players. But there was an aspect of, of Gonzaga, you know, 15, 17, 20 years ago, where it was kind of a little engine that could. They were ultra skilled, but now they're not only ultra skilled, they're ultra athletic and explosive and NBA first round draft pick type stuff. Yeah. When you just saw that one of them and Jalen sucks, you don't see those kind of behind the back moves going to the basket. That wasn't what they were doing 20 years ago. Offensive foul, we'll give it back to the Zags. When we come back, all of a sudden they've got their large of a lot of other great players in other areas uh, at the kennel that we weren't able to show. But it, it's, it's really been, as you said, Jay, one of the great success stories. I'll take Gonzaga greats for 400, Alex. That was very good. You got the whole row. Was there any any prior knowledge of what you're going to see there? You would have gotten them anyway, I'm sure. You want the truth? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder if the yes. Gonzaga players, like if, if all the alums are complaining about, like, you know, Richie Fromm and Blake Stepp and right. Matt Santangelo are going, hey, babe, where are we? Are we upper right. deck? Like, we don't get the good seats? Remember, it was just a four-point lead at the half. But Gonzaga's come out with, uh, I think, a little bit more intensity and purpose here in the second half in spite of the foul trouble that they've had. Well, and, and the term you use, purpose, they've been cutting with a purpose, you know, moving without the ball. That's a good, very good pass and good drive of the closeout. Holy cow. Everybody that falls down, it's a charge. That was not a charge. But they've been doing a much better job of moving without the ball. And, and as you said, uh, cutting with the purpose. That is not even close to an offensive foul. He's going the other way. I, mean, I don't know. You fall down, you get an offensive foul these days. Aaron Cook called for the offensive foul, so back over to Ross in the waves. It is a 22-9 run for Gonzaga in the second half. That is the score in the second half. Now Watson called for the foul. We talked about how they've gone, you know, all over the globe to recruit. They didn't have to go very far to get Anton Watson. He is a Spokane kid. Adam Morrison, Sean Mallon, the two other players of note. Uh, local kids who have gone on to play for the Zags. And Watson played for John Stockton's AAU team. Is also good buddies with one of Mark Few's sons. And But he's not here because of connections. He's here because he's a really good player, too. He is really good and is going to get even better. 
you know, he's an above the rim finisher that that plays with a ton of energy. And the next step for him, he's he's been working on his perimeter shot. And if he's able to stretch that shot out to three point range where he can consistently make it, you, know, you combine that with that athleticism, and he's a very good defender to be able to switch out on multiple positions like Anton Watson can. Now his shoulders healthy, good player. What a move! Wow. How many big guys in the country can do that and make it look as easy as Timmy just made it look? Three. <laughs> Ross misses the three. You know, you talked about guys getting better year by year and then, you know, having a breakout season. Watson's a pretty good candidate to put up some really big numbers next year like Ayayi is doing this year. Yeah, Ayayi's now got 20 points in this ball game. What a player he is. It's so impressive to see him play every facet of the game and he doesn't take a play off. You know, he defends at a high level. We've already talked about his reboundings big time. He's a leading rebounder on this team. Excellent passer. You know, there's nothing he can't do for this, this Gonzaga team. Boy, Timmy going to work. No hesitation right there. Spin move and a finish. Complete control of what he's doing. His footwork is just spectacular. And apparently, according to Coach Few, he can talk a pretty good game on the court, too. These guys are competitors. Yeah. But he came in with that, coming in from Texas. He's always been able to talk a little talk a little trash. Cedric Altman knocks one down, a bucket for the Waves. But again, a four-point game of the half, a 20-point lead for Gonzaga right now. But now a turnover on the handoff and a foul committed by Ayayi. That'll be his fourth Saturday thanks guys I love how Sean Farnham just advertised his own lack of versatility in praising Kevin Connors and Dallin Cup he just admitted like he is what he is but what he is is pretty good right it's very likable very personable he's a wonderful man a wonderful man <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, you know, when when you hear the news about NFL head coaches, I mean, I I can't help but think, what does Eric Bannemi have to do to get a job, a head coaching job? It's ridiculous. Like, he needs to be hired as an NFL head coach, and it needs to be now. I just don't understand it. I should know this, but who's your NFL team? Oh, the, growing up in Los Angeles, it was the Rams until they went to St. Louis, and then I wrote them off until they came back. So I, I don't like is, this move around stuff, Dan. Yes. But what you're saying is your team's playing my team in a playoff game on Saturday, I believe. Yes. On the frozen tundra. Yes, the uh, Edmonton. <laughs> Come on. Isn't now. that your team? Are you Come the Edmonton? Or, or are you more of a Rough Riders guy? No, I'm a, I'm a Packers guy through and through. It's, it's just... It's not going to be quite cold enough for Packer fans liking. Like, uh, at this time of year, especially against a warm-weather team, like you want an ice bowl, right, if you're a Green Bay fan. Well, the Packers are going to win. Coming up on SportsCenter, as Sean mentioned, Kevin Connors will be there along with John Anderson as Urban Meyer, the answer in Jacksonville. The Rockets take on the Spurs without James Harden. Boy, what a... What a big day in the NBA yesterday, and they will revisit one of the greatest quarterback matchups ever, Mahomes and Mayfield, from their collegiate days. Actually, Baker Mayfield started out as a quarterback. He's a walk-on at Texas Tech before he transferred to Oklahoma. Well, both teams are really getting after it. Pepperdine cannot finish. Gonzaga number one and undefeated. They've been number one from week one this year. They're one. Baylor's two. Two of the few undefeateds in the country as Altman will lay it in for the Waves. I think Mark Few wants to talk about possible to get multiple guys as first team All-Americans. I guess it is. You think Gonzaga's got a chance at having a couple of guys, two of these guys, be first team All-Americans? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think Corey Kispert's making an unbelievable case, not only for first team All-America, but I, I think right now, 
I think Luke Garza of Iowa is the national player of the year. I think he's going to be. I think he is right now. But I do think Corey Kispert is giving him a run. And, and it's a, at least a, a, a good discussion. But there's so many, you know, there's going to be so many players. Like Jared Butler would be on it for me from, from Baylor. And But what it, some of the traditional powers, whether it's Duke or North Carolina or uh, you name it, Kentucky, you know, they're not going to have they're not going to have players from those teams cracking first team All America with the seasons they're having, and so it's going to open it up for for you could have multiple players from a, a, a team like Gonzaga uh, and get you know Jared Butler making it things like that. Well, Suggs had a layup there, but instead he gets an assist as Kispert knocks down another three, his fifth of the game. And Kispert didn't get off to a great start, but. You know, he keeps playing. He, Kispert's the guy you have to stop on this team because he's the one that can go crazy on you. You know, they have three, four guys that can make threes, but there's only there's only one that can make seven or eight, and you're looking at it, Corey Kispert. He's already made nine in a game this year against Virginia. At 32 points, made nine threes. He's shooting just, I mean, just a notch under 50% from three-point range, period. Like, he came into this game shooting, what, 48% from three? Yeah. yeah and he's 61-48-87 on the season. Field goal percentage, three-point percentage, free-throw percentage. That's Reggie Miller stuff. Yeah. Said he came back to school to improve on some of the things he heard from the NBA and to win a national championship. And they got a shot, don't they? They got a great shot. Yeah. And a friendly roll there for Chukuka as he knocks down the three, the pick transfer. By the way, coming those. up about well, just over 10 minutes from now on ESPN2, another West Coast Conference game. It'll be BYU and St. Mary's coming in at the top of the hour. Yeah, BYU and, and Gonzaga played an unscheduled game after Gonzaga couldn't play against Saint, uh, against Santa Clara, excuse me. And, you know, so interesting listening to Mark Few. You know, he gave great credit to, to Mark Pope and, and BYU for playing that game on short notice. But, you know, a lot of coaches say we'll play anybody, anywhere, anytime. Uh, you know, Mark Pope clearly means it, but so does Mark View. He will. He'll play anybody. And, and basically, what do you say? You know, just make sure you have your phones on because there's a lot of conversation about, hey, we got an open date. You want to play? It's like scheduling a pickup game used to be. They've got a game coming up at St. Mary's on Saturday night, and you can see that here on ESPN. Chukuka again from the corner and knocks down another one. Boy, that was a really nice pick and pop. Yeah, Timmy jumping out on that screen roll situation, and Chukwuka just went right into the corner. He really gave himself some space where it was a tough recovery. Kispert again, Jay, is sixth on the night. It's ridiculous. And after a slow start, turned the ball over for Gonzaga. They've got, what, 17 assists now, and... Kispert so 6 of 11 from 3 in this game. A game high, 23 points for the senior. Another one for Chukwuka, his third three in the last couple of minutes. He was 5 of 20 from 3 coming into this game. He's already hit 3 in this one. Mark Few wants an and cutters. I would give the edge to Baylor in rebounding, uh, not only size but strength, and Mark Vidal Jr. also, and defense Baylor because they've got Davion Mitchell, uh, mentioned Mark Vidal. Uh, they're a better defensive team. Gonzaga's the better offensive team. Baylor the better defensive team. But, Dan, only Baylor is ranked in the top five in both offensive and defensive efficiency uh, this year. Gonzaga, they're number one in offensive efficiency. I think they're number 20, 21 or something in defense. Everybody would love to see whether they can somehow get it rescheduled during the regular season or whether they run into each other, say, in Indianapolis in April, that sort of thing. If they played tomorrow, Jay, do you, do you think one team is better than the other? Who would you pick to win that game right now? I would probably give a little bit of an edge to, to Gonzaga uh, because of the way they score. Uh, they're such a, a great offensive team. 
but I think by the end of the season, it's going to be awfully difficult to play against Baylor. It's tough to play against them now, but the longer we go, the better they're going to get. And uh, I, I think I would love to see these teams play, and I think they will play in Indianapolis. Now, experience, you give a slight edge to Baylor because they're older at almost every position. The toughness is even. Both these teams are tough. Baylor is is tough physically and mentally. So is Gonzaga. Hustle is even. Both these teams are competitors. Uh, go-to guy, I, I would give a, an edge to Kispert. It's just slightly over Jared Butler as the go-to guy. Gonzaga's got more offensive go-to guys. I think more players capable of busting out for 25 than Baylor. But, you know, with Flagler, Mitchell, Teague, Butler, I mean, they've got... And, and, uh, you know, they, they've just got Baylor's legit. They're really good. I think they're better than last year. And they were terrific last year. They would have been a one seed in the tournament. Both of these, both of those programs, Gonzaga and Baylor, would have been one seeds last year. Yeah, Baylor had a, uh, I thought, a great chance to reach a Final Four. Uh, I put, you know, look, I thought Kansas had one of its best shots to win it last year. And I really felt for, you know, Baylor, Florida State, San Diego State, teams like that, because those were the, maybe the best teams that, that those schools had ever had. Suggs gets to the Suggs. rim again. Boy, is it, it, you know, not to wear out the football analogy, and I know he's a quarterback, but boy, he's like a running back. When he finds a seam, he is gone. And this time he's got an easy deuce to add to his totals. Just so explosive getting to the rim. And... You know, we, we were talking about Gonzaga maybe not having their best first half and you know, turned over like he just blows right through that opening. Nobody comes over. Edwards tried to get there, but couldn't do it. And just a, a great finish at the rim. Just so explosive. But Gonzaga is going to score 100 again. And they 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 didn't put up near the first half that they were capable of and give give Pepperdine a, a lot of credit there. But this team scores a ridiculous amount of points. Coming into tonight, they are the first team in 30 years since Loyola Marymount did it to score 85 or more in their first 12 games. And they've already cleared that hurdle here tonight. Well, Dan, remember back in, in 2009 when North Carolina had that great team, wound up winning the national championship with Tyler Hansbrough, Ty Lawson, you know, Wayne Ellington, that Danny Green, that crew. You know, they, they scored like these guys, except that they didn't score quite as quite as easily, I'd say. But I remember talking to Roy Williams, and, and he would say, well, you know, our defense has to get better, but but kind of acknowledge that it's kind of hard to get a team to play defense the way you'd like when they can score 100 points falling out of bed. Yeah. And that's yeah. the way these guys are. They can score 100 points. They scored 98 on Virginia. They put up over 100 on Kansas. I mean, you just don't, that, that doesn't happen by accident. These guys are legit. Kispert with a terrific night to lead the way. Six threes, 23 points. Timmy with 20. Ayayi with 19. Suggs with 18. You wonder what the hair is going to look like for Kispert by the end of the year. If they're, you know, with COVID, can they get haircuts or, or are they having to go flow beat? Saturday got a full day of college basketball action for you. Jay just mentioned Roy Williams. We'll see Coach Williams Tar Heels take it on the Seminoles in a big time ACC matchup at noon Eastern and then into the SEC for Kentucky and Auburn at 2 o'clock. Both games are also available on the ESPN app. As we mentioned last time we talked about these games, Florida State dismantled NC State last night, 105 to 73. I mean, they're always deep and athletic and big. And when they make shots, they made 12 threes last night. And it was, I, I think, as good a game. Maybe what Florida State did last night and what Michigan did against Wisconsin, two of the most impressive games, performances, Jay, that I've seen this season. It was ridiculous, and MJ Walker was terrific, but they blew the doors off of NC State. And NC State's good. You know, there's a guy in the game right now for Gonzaga. We've talked about how people develop and the, they get better year after year. 33 in white, Ben Gregg. 
a freshman from Clackamas, Oregon, who graduated early from high school. So he is he's signed, he's active, and he's getting a few minutes here and there. This guy, from talking to Mark Few and from watching him just in the few minutes that he's played, he looks like a couple of years from now we could be talking about him in glowing terms, Jim. Yeah, maybe before that. You know, he's got size, obviously, 6'10", but he can shoot it. You know, he runs the floor well. He can rebound. He's been playing with the scout team primarily, but Mark Few wants to get him more reps with uh, with the top guys and see how he blends in because before the season's over, he, he can play meaningful minutes and, and really help this team out. You know, when you get to go up against a guy like Timmy in practice every day, that's not the worst thing in the world either. That helps you. Well, that, that's kind of the thing, Dan, about the, the amount of talent that uh, and experience that Gonzaga has is their practices are ultra competitive. So players that aren't getting a ton of playing time in games are getting significantly better every day in practice. And in some of the games, not to be insulting to, to some of their opponents, but some of the some of the practices they have are going to be more difficult than, than some of their games. Sports Center with John Anderson and Kevin Connors coming up next year on ESPN against Zaga. On its way to a 13-0 start, 4-0 in league play as the tip is good for Dominic Harris to make it 95-70. to Really nice move there by Straw there. He's coming off a good game. He had 12 against Portland in the time he... Greg down with a rebound, and the final seconds will run out on this game. Gonzaga got a stern test in the first half, only led by four at the break, but they win going away. Kispert and company with the big performances of the offensive end, and it's...